Hey everybody, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events this evening. And today we're really honored to have a uh, horror institution, uh, Richard Chismar here with us, um, founder of Cemetery Dance uh, and his brand new book, Chasing the Boogeyman. And Richard was kind enough to sign some very cool looking book plates for us. So I will go ahead and put uh, a link in the comments field if you'd like to order a copy. And then joining us tonight also is our good friend, Michael Corita, um, who also has a, he has a, a novel coming out as Scott Carson this fall. We were just discussing plans to either bring him out live or do some sort of virtual event. But always great to have you with, with us, Michael. Thank you. And Barbara at her home office is gonna be hosting the event. And I'll be um, behind the scenes here monitoring the comments field. So if you have questions for Richard or Michael, Go ahead and put them in anytime during the hour and i will be happy to ask them so barbara in the meantime i'm going to turn it over to you thank you very much this is really wonderful we haven't had a chance to talk to richard before although luckily for us we've talked to michael Herschel. i think every book but your very first book or did you did we do that one as well that my first book i uh i think i signed through the mail but then i i haven't let you off the hook since <laughs> Well, anyway, Michael, um, who's got a, a second persona in the horror field or the supernatural field, has very kindly agreed to chat with Richard here. Um, Patrick did mention that Richard is the founder of the genre magazine Cemetery Dance. He's also a prolific author, an editor, and anthologizer, one of my favorite words. Mm -hmm. And lately, Stephen King's frequent publisher and co-writer, which is a path that Michael wanted to go down and discuss. I actually listened to Stephen reading from Billy Summers today, and he was outside on his veranda or whatever it is in Maine, and there must have been a wind whistling through because the background sound was like a tunnel, and I really couldn't understand him, and I was sorry because I haven't heard him speak. Um, but anyway, he's gotten very active on social media, so that's fun for you, Richard. Do you know that his assistant, whose name I can't recall at the moment, lives here in Scottsdale in the winter? Marcia. Marcia. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yep, yeah, she's come in to do a few events at the Poison Pen, so we kind of keep up a little bit that way. Anyway, um, Cemetery Dance has done so well that it's in a reprint, but we still have some first printings with those gorgeous bookmarks here at the Poison Pen, so... Grab one while you can. Well, Michael, I'm ready way. to sit back and turn this over to you. I can't wait to hear what you all have to say. All right, thank you. Appreciate you guys hosting as always. And uh, Rich, this is, it's a pleasure for me. It's also kind of a little odd in a way because I feel like you and I have known each other. Yes. And yet we haven't had the, the face-to-face. So it's nice right. to have the, the virtual face-to-face. Yeah, one day, one day we'll do this in person. Yeah, exactly. One one day. Um, I don't want to do too much intro because I feel like people people know your work, but I would just want to say that one one thing that has drawn me to your work from the beginning and something I really appreciate and respect about um, about you as a person, there are a lot of people in this business who kind of, you know, they, they do the book promo thing and they do self promo. And then every now and then you run into someone who really genuinely loves books. And I feel like over the years, you kind of develop a different radar for like the book lover BS and then the people who are really authentic and genuine. Yeah. And I feel like you are as genuine as they come in terms of you are doing this because you love stories and you couldn't choose to do anything else. Yeah. Um, that, that's my guess, at least, but I, that leads me into my first question. The choice to go back and do this novel slash memoir slash true crime. <laughs> whatever it is. Whatever it is. What comes through from page one to the, the last sentence is a love of story. And I think that's what really drew me in and, and just, just held me. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about where you were in 1988 in real life and then into the book is that that's not a great question but well no it, it, it is a good question and, and what I, what I wrote about myself in the book is is really accurate um, you know it was a it was just a really interesting time because 
it, it was about, you know, I was kind of crossing that bridge from being a, you know, a carefree college student, which in reality, I never really was because I, I wasn't a big fan of school. Um, I graduated from University of Maryland journalism program, and I loved that. And I would have loved going out and being a reporter. Um, but during my senior year, that's when I started cemetery dance. I started reading submissions. I started, you know, fooling around with design and, 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 you know, all that kind of just kind of learning the ropes, bugging David Silva from the horror show, you know, three or four times a week, just kind of getting as much information as I could. Um, Cause there were no how to books. That was the thing. I was, uh, I just turned 22 and was selling short stories to a lot of the smaller magazines. And I, it, you know, I always tell people I was young enough and dumb enough to try it myself. And, you know, I graduated and I did not want to put together a resume. I just wanted to work on this magazine and, and my own writing. So I was engaged at the time. My wife was going to physical therapy school, graduate school. So we had some time and uh, we had, I think, nine months until we were getting married. So I moved back home. You know, and it was just a really interesting dynamic to be kind of right there on the cusp of, you know, of being what's supposed to be a self-reliant adult. And here I am living in the house I grew up in, in the bedroom I grew up in, looking out on the side yard where I played wiffle ball with my friends and marbles and, you know, kissed the first girl when I was, you know, 12 or whatever. So it, it was just it, it was to me, it was it was an environment that was ripe, you know, at the time for uh for the creative bug you know i was kind of looking forward and looking backward at the same time and what was going on in my town that led to chasing the boogeyman is there was some, there was an unknown assailant who was breaking into homes and he was in the middle of the night and he was caressing women's faces and their hair and their legs and when they woke up he would take off and the newspaper called him the phantom fondler and you know my brain ought naturally looked at that situation. First of all, it felt like we were living in a movie because the town itself was changing. People yeah. were buying locks, people were buying guns. It was, it was a little bit like Scream, you know, the movie from 20 years ago. Um, the, the town was on guard. Um, but naturally I was thinking, what if he progresses to, to more than touching? What if, you know, there's violence or even murder? So that's, that's kind of where the book came from. And uh, I just, I tried to think about it as, you know, writing this from the viewpoint of a normal, you know, first person narrator, you know, and it, it was obvious that it was going to be me no matter what. And it's some, when I decided to go the true crime format route, I just I said, you know what, I'm just going to make it me. I'm going to tell my story. So, OK, I, I find this fascinating um, in a way it kind of dovetails with an experience I had. And I think I I couldn't have gone this route for the same reason. There's a story in my hometown. I grew up in a college town, Bloomington, Indiana. And when I was in high school, there was um, a girl who was abducted and murdered. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it, you know, I remember our, our road being suddenly a search zone and mm -hmm. my friends were joining and, you know, searching these fields. It's, it's things that you capture in this book. Um, and I kept, I, I was captivated by that story for the same reason you're describing. It's suddenly you're living it. And then right. when you have the writer brain, you want to touch on, you know, you want to, you want to go into that territory. The only way I could ever write anything remotely about that story was by getting farther away from it. Right. But I also, in, in that circumstance, it had escalated to abduction and murder. And, and we knew that. So I'm curious if, if you lost the buffer you just described and it became more of a, Michelle McNamara, where you knew it, it really had been a serial killer in your town. Do you think you could have written the same book, the same approach? I think it, I think it would have been a true crime book. I think I would have had to take, you know, that that approach. Uh, I'm a big true crime fan. I've always thought, you know, when I look back at my, you know, at my early career, I think to myself, there's very few other jobs I think I could have done and done well. Um, being a lawyer is one that I've always thought I would like that because you do a lot of research You're, you know, if depending on, you know, the job you have, you're fighting for, you know, people who are, who, who need that protection and, and, and need people to stand up for them. And I, and I like, I like all that. Um, but, and, and like I said, I'm a true crime fan, but a lot of these true crime books I read and I'm overwhelmed by the amount of research that goes into it. And, and just, you know, the, the passion that you must have to write this kind of a dark story. Um, and, and in my mind, Chasing the Boogeyman, yeah, it, it was kind of a true crime type book 
but I could make up most of the research. Um, I mean, I, I made it as authentic as possible. I talked to a lot of detectives and a lot of, uh, you know, law enforcement, but I didn't have to, you know, I, you know what I'm saying? I made it up, yeah. which is, which is, you know, wonderfully lazy for, for, uh, you know, a nonfiction writer. So, but to answer your question, if, if there were actual murders, then yeah, I, I feel like I would have had to step back. I mean, I felt almost disrespectful at times writing Chasing the Boogeyman because I had, I had such a good time writing it. And I'm like, you know, Rich, you're, you're writing about girls being well, murdered. The, okay, so, so this is this gets into one of the elements of this book that um, I absolutely love. I feel like you are, you're really in, in a nice, subtle way. The story is absorbing on its own. But in a nice, subtle way, you, you're pushing at what we as readers and fans of crime uh, fiction, crime film, suspense, horror, pick your genre name, what we all let ourselves enjoy. And that is getting close to someone else's tragedy. Right. But then true crime, it's like, okay, there, there's this different set of journalistic responsibility. And the, the version I saw of this book did not have, I think, I, haven't, I don't have a copy of the finished book yet, but doesn't it say a novel like stamped right on the cover? Yeah, I mean, initially, I wanted to Blair Witch it. I wanted yes, to. Okay. So that, yeah. that, that, that's exactly what I'm looking at one that says the boogeyman, a true account of small town evil. Yeah, and you're looking at a really early, you know, the, boundary. the thing that I loved about that was it put me as a reader in this position of. I wanted to fact check you to the point that I actually I put I put Natasha's name in Google. Mm -hmm. to see like because I know so much of it's accurate you know it's like there's you there's the town the cemetery dance uh, so there there's all this accuracy and I wanted to know if there had been any real murders involved at all uh, and a lot of people found out that there hadn't been I'm like okay it's a novel I'm allowed to enjoy it right right uh, why are why do you think we need that sort of filter like there's an entertainment aspect to true crime Podcasts are going crazy right now. There's making a murderer, stuff like that. As an audience member, what do you think is the difference? You know, that's a tough question. And that's, that's again, I, I kind of had to examine that at times, even, even though my murders were make-believe, I had to, I, I felt that at times as I was writing it. And I tried to be honest about myself and, and, you know, the, the emotions that I would have went through as a 22 year old horror mystery suspense fan. Um, I mean, that was the summer silence of lambs came out. So I, I remember that summer, I, you know, I, I read that book and then I, I finished it and I went right back and I read it again. And, 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 and I, you know, I felt this is amazing right from, you know, the beginning before I heard how popular it had become. Um, but, you know, the best, the, the best thing I can pinpoint is, you know, and I even did it in, in Boogeyman. I made a reference to the, the weather, you know, the, the news channel guys and how you can kind of see that glimmer in their eyes when they're covering hurricanes and these natural disasters. And you can't help but, you know, and so for me as a horror fan with, you know, posters on my wall and in the bedroom I grew up in, they're still there. Um, yeah, you know, it was that struggle with with you can't help but like I said, you feel like you're in a movie, you feel like you're living one of, you know, one of these books or, or films. But at the same time, you, you know, we have to be repulsed by the real life, you know, tragedy, right? And I, I mean, to answer your question, I think plenty of people aren't. Um, and, and, you know, I, fortunately, I am. <laughs> but it's yeah. just, you know, so, it, so this is something I've always thought about. As another writer like you, who, who works in both crime and horror and has done supernatural and procedural. I feel like the horror fans are actually a little more honest about human nature in terms of like, no, you do slow down to look at the car crash. You absolutely right. do. And then there's the, the more polite mystery reader. More respectful. Like, no, 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 no. This is very much, it's, it's a situational sort of parlor room. We create our own layers of distance from it right and what i love about this book is the, the way i think you wrote it too is like you're, you're pushing it up against the reader's face in terms of the story is great but how much do you want to know about real death and i thought that was fascinating because there there is a difference and i and the difference draws people in um i would imagine i don't know this but i would imagine simon schuster's lawyers would have been like Oh God, no, we cannot use a true story on the cover. 
One hundred percent. I uh, one hundred percent. I like I said, my my I had this 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 kind of in-depth diabolical plan to kind of try to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. And even my oldest son, Billy, who, who just turned 22, um, he told me every day for, for the space about two weeks, dad, you can't do this. He was so worried. He's like, dad, you're going to get sued. You're going to make property values go down in Edgewood. Um, you can't do this. And I kept saying, Billy, first of all, we don't know whether 50 people are going to read this or 5,000 or what. We have no idea. You know, I, at the time, I hadn't even told my agent about it because I didn't want her to talk me out of it. Um, I knew it was a weird enough project that I kind of, you know, just wanted to do it and, and, and see what happened. But uh, yeah, no, he, I had many phone calls with the lawyers and okay, as a so result, I'm not wrong on that. no, you're, uh, you're dead on. I mean, as a result, it says a novel on the front as a result, it has a disclaimer, you know, right after the title page, which I made them write Cause I refused to write it. Not, not in a prima donna sense, but in, just in a, uh, you know, I was kind of moping by then. And, and, and uh, I actually remember telling Steve King, I'm like, I have to do this, right? <laughs> and, you know, he went off all oh, those publishers, you know, you, yeah, but you do have to listen, Rich. And, and it, yeah, I was pretty distraught. And then they had me write an afterward, which kind of pulls the curtain back and, and tells the secrets of the book. But no, I wanted to have an old website, like an old 1990s style website design. More like a Blair Witch kind of mythology. Yeah. I wanted to plant some fake newspaper articles online. Um, and then my son, who was a filmmaker, you know, I, I wanted him to do a documentary, a behind the scenes type documentary of uh, the crime, you know, a much more modern version and, and interview me as part of the story and interview, uh, you know, I, I, I have a, I had an actor and a good friend um, pose for the uh, pictures in the book as one as a detective, one as a police officer, as a sheriff's department. And I was going to have them be in the documentary and have, you know, some slides of the victims and just try to do something very professional. And uh, again, try to kind of pull the wool over people. And they nixed all that for me and, and, uh, and said, no. And, and I had lots of permission. I, I can say that to you because you are a publisher as well. So I can, I can complain about publishers to you. <laughs> um, one thing I think is really important to point out, like I, I opened this interview by talking about the approach and the medium. And I, as a writer, I wanna make sure everyone knows there is nothing about this story that is a gimmick. I, the reason the novel succeeds is because of your writing and because of the emotional authenticity of the writing. Thank you. And um, I think that's really important because when you're trying something bold and new, sometimes people can say like, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to roll my eyes at that, or I'm not into new things, new approaches. Um, if you just like a good novel, this book delivers. And Michael, may, what, may I ask a question? Um, Cause I, you're I, the I, boss. I think it's really fascinating. And the review that I quoted, I think it was from Publishers Weekly, but doesn't really matter. Um, says at one point, they say, this is it being your book. It's a remarkably convincing piece of metafiction. So tell me what you understand metafiction to be, because it is a term that's tossed around some, but I'm not sure that it's very well defined, just like people have all kinds of weird definitions of noir. Um, right, what yeah. do you understand metafiction to be, Richard? Well, what's interesting is, is I actually thought about that a couple times before I've done podcasts. I thought I should look that word up because I don't even know what the tech technical definition is. I take it as, you know, a mixture of fiction and fact and fiction. Um, you know, based on the author's own life. And, and that's, that's what I did. People, the most asked question at this point about the book has been how much of it is true. You know, no, give me I, don't think, I don't think that is the, I'm going to look it up. While you're no, talking. please do. I don't because think, because I, I edited and published a really fabulous book from an Australian author, which now has a different title. Her name is Sulari Gentle. And it won Australia's version of the Edgar for best mm -hmm. novel that year. It's now called After She Wrote It. But basically the story is about a, a woman who's a writer and she creates a, um, a series character for her fiction. And then the series character starts, takes over part of the book and you know, she, do they fall in love with each other or is somebody, oh, that's you neat. know? And, and so I don't think it really is really what, and it's always been called metafiction. 
So I'm going to figure this please. out. Um, I was going to say, please do. Please, please tell me. Yeah. Because um, it's been mentioned several times in reviews, and I keep but, thinking that. I keep, in, I, I'm just happy. I, I, the other reason I ask that is there have been, you know, you can see, I can see trends anyway, because I have to read, you know, like everything. And one of the trends, Michael and Richard, that's been coming along is that people have been writing novels, but they've been inserting podcasts. Now, these are fictional podcasts, you know, not right. actual podcasts. But um, sometimes you see people now putting in text messages or emails as part emails, of the narrative. Right. But increasingly now I'm seeing podcasts as, um, as part of the narrative. And again, um, I wonder, you know, your book has obviously been more successful than your publisher thought because they, they have, you know, had to go back to press and print more of them, which is always a sign that it did, it, it did extremely well. Um, I'm wondering to what degree the interest in podcasts or, you know, true crime, which has been more dramatic in the last few years, has influenced a kind of fusion of elements of podcasting and true crime now with right. fiction. And so the difference is that you were supposed to have made it up, even if there were right. parts of it that were true, in order to avoid any awkward legal issues. Right. And so right. I'm wondering if that's what makes your book metafiction. Anyway, you keep on talking. I'm going to Google <laughs> metafiction, try to figure this out. Please do. Yeah. And I, I do, I do, I do know the true crime crossover has definitely helped the book become more popular. There's it, it's experienced such a surge in popularity these last couple of years. So Rich, if you don't mind, tell me a little bit about, you've been writing short stories for, I mean, years, as long as you've been writing for as long as you've been reading, it seems like you had a novel co-written with Stephen King, which, you know, like that that's a normal way to come into the business. Everyone <laughs> has that yeah. casual co-written Castle Rock novel. No pressure mm -hmm. at all there. Castle Rock, no one brings any expectations. And then this is your first um, first novel under your own name. H had you ever envisioned it being something completely separate from cemetery dance king country overlap you know what's interesting i mean when i started like i said you know i was a writer before i was an editor and a publisher and and that was uh that was what i wanted to do and then you know the the editing and the publishing kind of took over for for about a decade completely um you know i was working uh earlier when you talked about you know you kind of you feel like you kind of uh, pegged me as a, as a true book lover and, you know, not somebody who's kind of posing, but is, you know, for better or worse, that's me because you read them. Yeah. I, I read them. I, I love that. them. I smell the pages. I I've all, you know, I was probably eight years old, you know, writing my war and my monster stories and, and, you know, handwriting them and giving my mom copies and and uh, you know I was the kid walking at night with his friends telling the ghost stories and trying to scare them and and the whole thing so so yeah from an early age I wanted to do that um I so I always you know that was the dream is to be a writer and then all of a sudden because you know you had to pay bills and because frankly the magazine you know the the workload was dictated by you know, the fact that I was trying to trying to make this a full time job. So, yeah, I always tell people my 20s were spent uh, learning how to do, you know, desktop design and folding them flyers and shoving them in envelopes and putting stamps on them and doing direct mailings because there was no Internet back then. Um, just trying to grow my business. Now, were you working on a novel the whole time or were you working on short stories? I mean, I, I guess part of my question is, when did you turned to the novel and I mean do you do you have some sitting in drawers did you send some out I have no I don't I have some partials you know I I was focused mainly on short stories and a few longer pieces that kind of crept into novella land um you know really early on I met a I met a writer named Ed Gorman and uh he kind of took me under his wing and, and was my first kind of literary uh you know mentor and and became a, a good friend and um you know, I learned a lot about writing from Ed. Ed encouraged me from, you know, day one, get to work on a novel, Rich, get to work on a novel. And I just kept saying, you know, I, I, I can barely keep up with the publication work. So, so no, there, you know, the first, I, I would say early thirties is, is when I, you know, started churning out some longer pieces and saying, you know, no, I, I don't want to finish this. This isn't what I, and it wasn't a matter of discipline. It was just a matter of, you know, I was still in that stage where I was, you know, 
I kind of had to take that leap of faith in myself um, that people might actually be interested in reading this at some point. And I wasn't just writing it for myself. You know, now as an older and semi wiser, you know, writer, I don't care. I'm just, I'm writing it for myself and having a good time. And as long as it pleases me, then it's a bonus if, if it's actually saleable and marketable and it pleases someone else. And that's uh, chasing the boogeyman couldn't be a better example of, of that. It, it, like I said, I didn't even tell my agent because I thought once I got into the story, once I wrote the introduction piece, you know, those five or six pages, I knew I was going to write the entire novel, no matter what. Um, and fortunately, you, you know, won her over. <laughs> I know, obviously, every, everyone asks you or is going to ask you um, about Steve and his generosity. And I want to come back and, and talk about that because it's part of your story. And he also is, I feel like, one of the most uniquely generous writers that, you know, the business oh. has ever known. So we'll come back to that. Okay. But I'm going to guess that his presence in um, your recent life can kind of drown out a lot of writers were involved early on. I mean, when you're launching Cemetery Dance, you mentioned Ed. Who who else was a an influence or a support? Um, there was a writer, and 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 I mentioned him already. He 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 had published several novels, a lot of really good, you know, award winning short stories. A, a guy named David Silva, and his yeah. magazine was called The Horror Show. And it was actually once I found out that Dave was kind of a one man show. I mean, he had, you know, columnists and he had our artists and freelance. And, and, and of course, he bought stories, but he did the design. He did the marketing. He bought I mean, he's, you know, sold the ad space in the magazine. He did the proofreading, everything. Once I found out he did that I, again, I was 22 and, and young and dumb. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So it, he was the first. And then there was Ed Gorman. Um, you know, Joe Lansdale was very influential. Yeah. But it was Steve right from the beginning. I mean, he, you know, I went to college more as a lacrosse player than, than as a student. You know, I played college lacrosse. I was on scholarship. And in my junior year, I got hurt. And that was right when it came out in hardcover. And at the time that book came out, I was lost. I didn't know what I was going to do next because, you know, kind of my identity was gone. And I read that book. And by the time I finished the 1200 pages or whatever, I thought, oh, I remember now I want to be a writer. And two weeks later, I was writing for the college newspaper. Um, I transferred to the University of Maryland, you know, graduated from their journalism program and never stopped writing. So it was it was. Had you read him before or was it your introduction? You no, know, I had read him before. I've, I'm one of five siblings and everyone in my family was a big reader so I was reading whatever I could find you know I had three sisters so I was reading Sidney Sheldon and just whatever you know was on the shelf and at some point in there I read Salem's Lot um my 10th grade English teacher brought in a photocopy of uh of King's uh Ch um the monkey I was about to say chattery teeth but no I published that the monkey and that that was my first I remember that very very clearly when we finished reading that aloud in class I just thought that is the most amazing experience to be able to do that to people. I would like to do that. And so there were a lot of dots, you know, my early war stories and monster stories. And then there was reading the monkey and then it was it. And then, and then it was just all dots after it, it was all, you know, it had, beca it became my life. And um, so, yeah, I, you know, I sent everything we did to Steve and he was always a part, you know, he was always there kind of. I feel like one of the things that, he does so well is bring people into a a believable and knowable world it's you suddenly connect it with your own childhood your own current moment and that's a very easy thing to say you know to say well let's make the characters grounded so we can bring in right. the supernatural it's, it's a great little thing to say it's very very damn difficult to do yeah. and one of the things that really impresses me about your writing is the way you conjure this sense of a town and a place and friends. Actually, I was thinking of, you have an early scene where they're on bikes that actually makes me think of the opening of Mystic River, where you just immediately feel like you know these kids and this neighborhood and it's real. And I'm curious how, how you go about making that approach. And does it start with place? Does it start with characters and memory? Like, how do you get into the edgewood of your childhood? Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm going to go back and, and again, uh, I'll give you the short version is when my short stories kind of started finding an audience is, and, and this is something I learned from Ed Gorman. 
I, you know, my early stories, I always try to reinvent the wheel and do something startlingly original, you know, kind of envision the reviewer is going to read this and say this, this story by Chismar is startling original, you know, startlingly original. And uh, they never were. They Did anyone ever say that? Did you get no, that review? No, no. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, Ed Bryan and Locus gave my first collection a wonderful review. And then he pegged me perfectly. He's like, but when it comes to the supernatural, you get the idea that the author doesn't quite buy into it yet. And I was sitting, you know, I remember I was sitting there reading the magazine going, yeah. <laughs> um, but what I learned from reading some of Ed Gorman's short stories um, were just that you didn't have to do that. You just had to tell a really honest story. Um, it had to come from an honest place inside of you. It didn't mean it had to be real. It had to be based on something from your life, but it, it had to come from that authentic, honest place. And to answer your question, whether it is a person or a place or a moment in time, that's when I started writing stories is when I kind of, I, I kind of stopped trying to, to make the story big. And I just started trying to tell the best story I could. And I, I remember the day it happened. I saw a woman at a, at an old payphone with a little girl kind of hanging on to her, uh, to her blouse. And I just immediately, I was always that weird guy who would like, you know, the holidays, everything's festive, but I would see the old guy in the corner who kind of had the glimmer in his eye. And I think that guy's lonely. And I, I would always kind of see the sad side or the darker side. Um, but I still remember seeing that woman at the phone booth and I knew her story. I knew what it was. And I told this very quiet, you know, story about her. And I ended up selling it to, you know, I, I remember when I finished, I thought this is exactly the kind of story that in the first 10 years, I wouldn't dream of writing. And I ended up selling it to, you know, to a big crime anthology and, and, and it kind of paved the way for me. So as far as Edgewood, I just, you know, it, I, I've said chasing the boogeyman in many ways is kind of just like a campfire story. It's me sitting around with all my friends I grew up in. And just like I used to, when I was a kid, I used, we would walk up, you know, we would walk through the neighborhood at night and I would tell scary stories. And then at some point, strategic point, I would turn around, look behind me and scream and take off running. And my friends still remember it. They still curse me for it. Um, so that, to me, that's what chasing the boogeyman is. I just try to kind of tell this little campfire story. And uh, once I got past that point of self-doubt where I, I thought, who's going to want to read this? And I said, you know, it doesn't matter. I want to read it. I want to write it and read it. Um, you know, it all came very quickly. It was it was a very fast book to write. So I'm going to interrupt now and say I looked up metafiction and it really does apply here, Richard. Metafiction is a form of fiction which emphasizes its own constructedness in a way that continually reminds the audience to be aware that they are reading or viewing a fictional work, which I don't like nearly as well as this one. The main purpose of metafiction is to highlight the dichotomy between the real world and the fictional world of a novel. Metafiction can be used to parody literary genre conventions, subvert expectations, reveal truths, or offer an unvarnished version of human nature. Oh, I like that. So um, it is a way of playing with normal structure or convention by, you know, and, and I, that applied to the book I mentioned to you after she wrote him, which, oh, I, need to, uh, I, need to which read I really liked, but obviously really applies to you. And that's what, what the review that I quoted was, was referring to, because that sentence came right after the photos were staged by Chismar and his son, Billy, in a Baltimore production company. And it said, the book is presented as true crime, complete with pages of photos ostensibly called from local newspaper collections. And, you know, so I think that metafiction was their way of saying you, you attempted to give the novel a feeling of true crime. For sure. Incorporating these elements, but of course you actually ended up making most of them up. Right. And what's interesting is even with the disclaimer on the front, you know, the early page. And even with it saying a novel on the front, a lot of people have still said exactly what Michael did, said, you know, that they've Googled that, you know, halfway through the book, they started Googling things and, you know, people's names and incidents. And I, you know, I, 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 I like hearing that because again, my, my plan, my original plan was a little bit different, but, uh, but because yeah. you're just warped enough to appreciate I am. I really, oh, I really, on, wanted, Michael. he's just trying to give readers a different experience. I wanted people to get mad at me at the end and say, Oh, I, Rich, I can't believe you did this to me. And, and thank God these girls are alive. And, you know, I, and I tell it, you know, I tell them at the end, you know, hey, they're, you know, they're my friend's daughters and they're, you know, people I've known their whole lives. So, you know, the only one I couldn't, 
my, my next door neighbor's, uh, you know, 18 year old, or she's probably older now, but she was the only one. I, I see her every day. So she had to be the girl who escaped. I, I didn't want her to be, to be one of the, you know, one of the victims because I see her too often and it would remind me. You, but uh, yeah, I'm glad you looked that up. That's interesting. You've got that, the, the right touch of superstition to the process. The, uh, I would imagine staging the photos was great fun. I mean, you want to tell us a little bit about, it was a, you, you said you were working with your son during that. We did. We, uh, he, he loves those kind of things. And, 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 you know, like I said, it, it's probably, you know, once he found out that it was going to be stamped a novel, he relaxed some because he was a wreck. It, it, I still, I, I still grin just thinking about it, but yeah, we had fun. You know, I used friends. Like I said, I used a lifelong friend as one of the detectives I used, um, a friend who I met uh, is my younger son's basketball teammate's father as, as the main detective in the case. And I, I try to keep in mind, you know, I need to be able to pull these people back to use for the documentary or for other, you know, photograph, you know, possible photos. Um, and then there's a, a local production company who I've worked with on a, a couple short films and, and they're great folks and uh, do really good work. And for some of the more complicated ones where I needed a car that was 88, you know, or, or before, and I needed a police uniform that was, you know, and I needed a certain look, you know, I, I left it to them to go out and bring in actors and, and to, you know, do the wardrobe. And I, I think they, they shot pictures over two days. And I think Billy and I shot pictures over two or three days. And then we just, you know, picked the ones for the book. And I, uh, you know, right from the beginning, I knew I wanted to do that. Just kind of like what Barbara said, I wanted to add that that authenticity to the project, which is the same reason I asked James Renner to do a uh, forward to the book. Um, I love I wanted, it. Yes, that's nice. That's I wanted an nice outside thing. established true crime, you know, voice to kind of say, hey, guys, you know, this is how I'm involved and, and, and I, I add another layer of authenticity. And, and so, yeah, like I said, my diabolical plan did not work out, but I think it made for an interesting read. You know, I, I think it's working out. I think people are, are reading the book and they're loving the book. Um, was, was James immediately all in when, uh, how, how did you go about pitching him? You know, I know James only through email. Um, but I actually said, and, and, if, and people who know me know I'm not a, you know, I'm a kind of, I'm a behind the scenes kind of a person. I mean, I, I don't even really like to get on the phone that often. Uh, I'm, I'm much more, you know, let's trade emails. Um, and I don't go to conventions or writing, writing conferences, those kind of things. So again, making myself the main character surprised a lot of people, including myself. But with James, I actually, the point of all that was to say with James, I emailed him and said, hey, can we get on the phone so I can kind of tell you about something and, and, and ask you a question? Because I knew I couldn't do it in email. I, I knew it would sound horrible. So I, I he, you know, he called or I called him and I was able to kind of describe the book and stumble through it and just say, so this is what I'd love for you to do if you're interested. And he, he jumped right on. He, you know, he's like, this will be so much fun. And I'm like, oh, you can tell he's having fun from yeah. that. Yeah, you can tell. Yes. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask about, and it's kind of ironic because we were struggling to connect tonight due to thunderstorms, but you have a segment early on where it, to me, it's just, it's a beautiful scene. It's you or Rich, I don't, you know, it's, it's the protagonist it's me. and his father. And um, you remember it as the summer of thunderstorms. Well, these attacks are happening and you, you guys are in the garage and you're going out to watch storms. And I was curious if that was actually part of the sensory memory or if you just decided to layer that in. It's, it's a beautiful little element. Yeah, no, that's real. I have, I have really you know, crystal clear memories of, of standing at the bottom. We lived at the bottom of, of a, you know, of, of a hill on Hanson Road and you could stand at the, I, you know, I would be riding my skateboard down there or whatever, but it, my father was, everything in that early section is, is true. Um, it, you know, the section of, of looking back into my youth and kind of trying to give the reader a, a, a sense of time and place and what my town and my home and my street were really like. Um, it came from memory, you know, I didn't, I didn't embellish those, um, you know, uh, an interviewer asked me, were you tempted? And I actually said, you know, I said, well, this might sound kind of corny or, or cheesy, but no, you know, I felt, I, I felt this like sacred obligation to just tell the true stories because they were meaningful enough. And I didn't want any of that to be, to be fiction. So yeah, I, there are many thunderstorms. My dad would be tinkering in the garage and he'd, Rich, come take a look. And the same thing with my father working under the hood of a car and me trying to help him and 
spinning in circles and losing my mind because I was not mechanically inclined. And, and my father finally said, Rich, go ahead, you know, go play. Um, so yeah, all those, you know, I, I love that you picked out that memory because I, I, I was talking to a friend about our fathers, his and mine, um, just this past weekend. And, and that's what I said. I said, writing this book, you know, what, it was so much fun. And at times almost felt self-indulgent because I, I just, you know, my parents, my, my mother's been gone since 2001. My father's been gone since 2007. But for the months that I wrote this book, they were alive and I could smell my mom's home cooking. And I, you know, I got to sit on the front porch and talk to my dad and the whole thing. And, and that was neat. That was, that was a gift that uh, I dreamt of them more over the, the time period that I wrote the book. And it was just, yeah, it was a gift for me. That's I, you can, you can feel it in the pages. And I, I think it's one of the things I responded to uh, on, on a deeper level. It's interesting. I would not have thought of the question, but I, I didn't know that. So you write about your parents passing in 2001, 2007. That's in the book, right? In the book in the afterward. Yeah. And yeah. so, okay. I have a note somewhere in here In my, in my draft, I just thought this was funny from our shared, you know, Stephen King fandom. Um, I had a note that said, to me, some of the best emotional writing is on page 217. So I'm just reacting to 217 as right. sort of a joke, but that's, that's where you're talking about your parents, I believe. Okay. Uh, two, yeah. 216, 217. So when you get to that stretch, at that point, you're you're leaving novelist mind, and, and you're uh, it's it really is almost more memoir. And another note I had in there, I don't know what page it falls on, but I was curious if you were trying to set something up because I know you and your son have worked together on some things. But you reference how his ver his draft of the manuscript is all marked up and filled with notations, right? And I was sort of thinking, like, well, what is he trying to suggest here? But you're saying Billy was actually worried about he's he's looking at it like an attorney. Well, part of that was was the documentary, you know, the okay. idea that he that he, you know, the other part of it the, was just that Billy has Billy. Uh, people call people say he is, you know, my 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 double, you know, we think alike, we look alike. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't love him anymore, but he is, he's been editing me since I used to tell him stories, you know, read him stories or make them up since, you know, he was six years old or something. Dad, it would be better if, you know, the dragon was not a dragon, but a blank, you know, a sea monster. So it, that was, a, that was almost my little uh, humorous nod to the fact that, that of course he has notes on what I'd written. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, uh, He's yeah, I'm glad all that stuff, guy. you know, resonated for you because it, uh, again, there, that is, you know, I've put pieces of myself in a lot of my short stories, you know, there's Hanson Road is mentioned a lot, Weeping Willow Trees are mentioned, you know, and, and I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of that until I put together my, my first big collection that, you know, hey, you do kind of return to these things quite often, but this was the first time where at some point it just hit me this, yeah, this is, this is, you know, your life. And when you get to the outside, you know, um, you know, incidents of, of, of murder and, 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 you know, disappearing girls and all that, yes, that's, that's where you're making it up, but you really are weaving it into an intricate, you know, story with what you, you know, really lived. And it, it was just interesting because I, again, the book came quickly. Um, I would love to claim that I, you know, that I had this, idea to to weave this kind of you know unique story it, i was just following i i've told people this is really an example of a story that was already there and i was kind of just brushing away the the dust and, and the sand to expose it because uh, i i didn't feel like i was you know creating this so much as i was just you know getting other stuff out of the way you you weren't trying to be startlingly original. No, see, it works out when you're not. <laughs> I uh, there's I, a lesson yeah, no. there. Yeah. All right. So the 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 obvious question. Um, the book comes out. It's as Barbara mentioned. It's already into a second printing. I don't know what the official pub day is, but tomorrow you're only like it's right. You're not even a week into it. They're already into a second printing. So I'm I'm going to play publisher now and say what are you going to give us next? Because we need something else, man. Yeah. Well, what's funny is that is I've said all along, there's, there's two, 
you know, there's, there's two projects that, that are kind of right there on the, uh, on the table waiting for more attention. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to be hard not to write the sequel to this because I've won, I've, you know, from the time I finished it and I purposely structured the, the interview with the killer in the afterward at the end to, to leave a, to leave a handful of doors open. Um, I didn't want to explain everything. And part of that was, you know, actually none of it was laziness for a change. So that's, that's pretty wonderful. Um, but it, I, I always like those stories that leave some, you know, some unanswered questions, but I also always thought, uh, especially with, you know, the stuff that he left on the, uh, you know, at the memorials and, and, you know, kind of his calling cards, I always thought, you know, I know what what they mean but i don't want to i don't want to talk about it right now so maybe in the second book and and again i haven't even men mentioned the sequel to my agent or or any or or my publisher but if i had to bet on it i'd say that that's what i'm gonna pitch them next so hopefully they're hopefully this does well enough that they're excited by that idea it, it sure sounds like it's it's going to and that's exciting i love the way you did such a nice job with the transcripts they're both they're believable and then also they they build that sense of there, there's another layer to the story it continues and right. i think it's also a credit to the way you created edgewood it, the place i just feel like it has that castle rock vibe of there's there's more going on here we have other stories mm -hmm. um and i'll sort of use that to back door into if you don't mind telling me a little bit about where you are with the castle rock stories will you do another and um, are you and Steve talking about collaborating on anything again? Um, you know, the third one's finished. Um, Gwendy's final task. Uh, it's a full length novel. It's, um, you know, it's not a doorstop. It's not one of Steve's full length novels, it's like one of mine. Um, but it's, it's a but civilian's it's, novel. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's scheduled to come out next February um, in hardcover from, from Cemetery Dance. And then it will come out three or four months later in, in trade paperback from, from gallery again. Um, and yeah, I'm excited by it. I'm as to whether there'll be anything after that, you know, I'm not sure, but you know, we never discussed a, a sequel after the first one, you know, several in interviewers asked us and I always just kind of smiled a goofy smile and said, it's up to the big guy. And he always just said, well, you know, I'm not planning on it, but I'm not planning, you know, not to either. So, um, we'll see. So, yeah, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, this one was was a particular thrill because it was it was his, you know, with the second one, it was more my idea. And he was busy uh, writing a different book. And and, you know, again, I'm not I, I, I must not be the brightest bulb because I've admitted this before. But when when Steve said, I love your idea for what gwendy has been doing for book two and you need to write it. I'm busy with this right now. I completely took that as you go write the first draft, Rich, and then I'll come back and make you look really good and, and do a pass. And so I sent him this complete manuscript where I, I essentially re, you know, I, I bring Castle Rock back from the dead. I bring his old, some of his old characters into the story. Uh, and uh, Steve reads it and he's like, this is great. You know, if you want me to, I'll give it an edit, but uh, I don't need to write it. This, you know, you're all good. And I'm, I'm, you know, stammering saying, Steve, I never would have went back to Castle Rock like this if I knew it was just me. I never would have had Alan Pag bang, you know, come back and the whole thing. Um, so, again, you know, one of those happy accidents where, you know, I never would have had the nerve to do that. But, uh, I, you know, I just thought he was going to do it. So <laughs> he, There's a, a fascinating level of trust in there, but also a level of... Uh, it's, it's almost like a coach. He's getting your best work out of you and you don't know exactly how, but he's, he's getting you to deliver it. Well, what's interesting is that's what the third book felt like, but, but actually, and, and I'll probably be struck by lightning for saying this, it kind of felt that, like that going both ways. And, and I remember at some point, you know, I sent him this long text, this, this very earnest, I'm sure, sincere text saying, you know, to me, this is what a true collaboration feels like. And this is what when it's working and this is how fun and, and magical it should be because we didn't discuss, you know, I, I took his 50 page section and, and then I wrote, I didn't, you know, he didn't say, Hey, Rich, this is where I want you to go. He just kind of said, Hey, this is, this is where it's waiting for you. you. Pick it up and run with it. I didn't go to him and say, Hey, are you okay? If I do this, you know, the third book, we go back to dairy um, as well as castle rock. 
And that was, you know, going back to dairy was my thing. And I remember as I'm writing it going, he might hate this, but I'm not going to ask him. I'm just going to write, you know, I don't care if he kills my pages and says, do it again. I will. But he didn't. He was yeah. kind of tickled. He's like, oh, we're back in dairy. So, you know, the third book was his idea. He came, you know, I got some, I got a series of Sunday night texts where I could tell he was very excited. And by the end of them, I just said, are you going to write this one with me? I want no misunderstanding. And he's like, yeah, let's, you know, let's block some time and write it together. Okay. So that, do you, are you able to like go to sleep at night after that and just get back to work? I mean, if I, I'm trying to think of the, of a experience that runs parallel to Stephen King saying, yeah, I want to write a novel set in Castle Rock and then just saying like, okay, we'll go tackle this. I mean, there's a lot of pressure there. There, you know, by the time the third book came along, I was fine, you know, uh, well, mostly fine. But with the first one, the novella, you know, Wendy's Button Box, you know, I, I've told the story before, but, you know, it, it, I, I was on my way to my youngest son's basketball game with my wife and I'm in the passenger seat. She's driving because if when I drive, she gets car sick and we and we start squawking. So she drives. Um and, and I was texting Steve about something. And then I asked him about uh, round robin novels. I've, I've always kind of been fascinated by having, you know, eight or 10 or even four, you know, writers, you know, write a continuing story and, and try to, you know, make it seamless. And he's like, yeah, you know, they're kind of interesting to me. And then he started talking about collaborations. And by the end of that, that it, actually it wasn't text, it was email. By the end of the email exchange, he had mentioned that he had a story he'd never been able to finish called Wendy's Button Box. And I, you know, sometimes he gives, you know, us sneak peeks of, of his works, which, which is a, a beautiful thing. And, and uh, I, I, at some point I just say, well, send along if you want. I'd love to see it. Well, he sent it along the next morning, um, the first 20 pages. And he just said, do whatever, do, do with this as you wish. And, I, and I'm thinking, and I wrote back and I, because I knew he didn't want me and I could publish it. You know, I'm not going to publish the first 20 pages of an incomplete Stephen King story. So I said, what do you mean? Do you, you, you want me to finish it? He said, if you can, I'd love for you to. So that was Friday. I, you know, who, who, you know, tells his wife everything, did not mention a word of it to my wife on Friday, Saturday until Sunday night. And I finally just told her and I said, so, you know, this is real. This, this could really happen. And I was, I was terrified to answer your question. I didn't sleep much. Monday, I woke up and I sat down to write some notes and my hand was shaking. And I thought, Rich, this is ridiculous. Just open your laptop. And, and that's the, the neatest thing happened. I opened my laptop and I just started writing. And before I knew it, there was, you know, I think in the, that day and the following day, I finished 10,000 words. And I just said, you know what? I sent it to Steve because I, I knew if I tried to make it, perfect or continue to polish or started polishing it I would never finish and he liked it and then we just went back and forth and you know I wrote the original ending he said Rich this is too dark what's wrong with you um we kind of went in made some you know some changes I went in and made one minor change and then that was it but you know the first novella took us a month to kind of play ping pong with back and forth and the entire month was yeah I, I don't remember anything else um, I don't remember who won my kids basketball game. And, and like I said, I'm one of those dads who, you know, is at all the games and, and loves it. And, you know, I, I have no idea what happened that, that, that month. It I was, feel like what you're describing there is sort of the ultimate fantasy of um, you, you put everything into something that you love. And for you, it's, it's this genre, it's this craft and it's a writer that you love, you know, it ends up not just turning out that he reads your stuff and likes it, but you work with him, you develop this friendship. And that's a really happy, fantastic ending that only comes from someone paying it forward. And so now I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of the same thing. I know you're a publisher first, writer second. Who are you really excited about right now? Who should we be reading? Who maybe we don't know yet. Not, not just, you know, Michael Connelly, Stephen King, but you know, it's interesting because I've kind of uh, over the last year and a half, I've had to take a step back from the publishing side because um, th thankfully I can. It's no longer me, you know, working out of my apartment um, or me working out of my basement or my garage. We actually have, you know, nice offices and, and a staff. And yeah, even that surprises me and it still continues to be, you know. I remember the first time I, you know, we expanded to the warehouse next door and I locked up by myself one evening and I'm, and I'm like, how did this happen? You know, I actually pay insurance for employees. And, and again, this is from the, you know, 
the first 10 years I, I made, you know, I, I income tax day was always the sad day because I compute out my mounds of hours and, and, you know, how much money we brought in. I'd be like, Hey, Kara, you know, I'm making six cents an hour right now. <laughs> Aren't you glad you married me? Um, so to answer your question, um, I've kind of had to step back. Um, you know, if I had to pinpoint one writer, you know, um, or just what have you read recently that you're excited about? Just in general. I've been on a, I've been kind of on a hot streak. I mean, I read, you know, the last couple of galleys I've read, you know, the, the Stephen Graham Jones, um, you know, My Heart is a Chainsaw. Okay. It's wonderful. Um, and not, I'm not even saying that because it's the same publisher. It's just, you know, a great book. And I've learned that. I'm like, you always have to say good things about books from your publisher. And I'm like, that's new to me. Um, I always just tell the truth. <laughs> um, who else, you know? Just, uh, you know, C.J. Tudor's books, you know, these are people who, I've, you know, I've just kind of over the last few years kind of, you know, Carolyn Kepnes, I, I guess she's been around longer than I think. But, you know, to me, I, I you know, how, when did she publish her first book? When did she publish you? I don't know. You know, yeah. um, you know, uh, who else? And Chris Golden's been around forever, but I read his new book in Galley and it's it's you know, I agree with everybody else. It's his best book. I'm going to pull that and make you use it for your next Chris Golden blurb. Just Chris Golden's been around forever. <laughs> yeah. Period. The end. He's else. watching. The Chismar yeah. just called me old. Uh, I, we're both big Stuart O'Nan fans. So oh, I've got yeah. to plug his new one, which I think is fantastic. I don't know the pub date. Um, it's called Ocean State. And it's to me, it's like a, a bit of a return to darker O'Nan. Okay. Or of the, the night country. Um, so Stewart's always been fascinating to me and he's always been the one writer who, and I give, a, I give a lot of his books as gifts to, to, to friends. And I always say, this is the, you know, this is the kind of writer I'd love to be if I could write like this guy, because I can't, you know, I am not a stylist. I'm never going to be, you know, mistaken for that. I'm just kind of the bread and butter storyteller, but I always give his books away. And I always say, this is the kind of writer I would be because you know what? He writes exactly what he darn well pleases. And no two are alike. I, we had, I had the, uh, the prayer before dying, you know, discussion with someone online about a week ago. And I, I told him, I, I, cause he was, he was, he was kind of euphoric because he, he had just discovered this, you know, the writer and this book. And I told him, I said, that book gave me nightmares. I've given that book to so many people just, but yes. it's the perfect, just try this. You've never experienced anything like it and you will love it if you like good writing, good storytelling book. Yes. And it, I, I always tell people this thing will seep into your bones, into your blood. And for me, it seeped into my nightmares because the guy was just astonished at how quiet it was, but also how, you know, kind of penetrating the, the story was and some of the details. And that's what I said. I said, oh, you know, he, he, he would throw, you know, two or three understated sentences out that you would not be able to, you, you couldn't stop thinking about for the next day or two. Um, so yeah, Stuart is, is, I can't wait to read his new one. I, uh, I read all of them, you know, even the little lobster one. I, I mean, uh, last night, I love that one. Yes. Oh, we, should, we should wind this up. Michael, tell us about the Scott Carson book in October, and then we need to see if Patrick's got any questions for us. Patrick, come uh, join us. Scott Carson has a book in October. It he is. Does. Appearing it is. at the Poison Pen on October 26th. October 26th, I'll be there. Oh, really? I've seen a lot of advertisements for mindfulness apps during the pandemic as a way to sort of reduce anxiety. And I thought, well, what if one of them was actually designed to do something evil and terrible and um, away we went. So that's, that's my setup for that. And one I've read it. Barbara and you rich. This was a I've read book. that book, by the way, and it's a great book. I enjoyed What's it. What's the title guys? Where they wait. Where they wait. Where they I'm wait. learning how to, how to sell books. Slowly but surely. I love it. Yeah, it helps that's the right. title. Where They Wait by Scott Carson. You can get an autographed copy at the Poison Pen in October. Patrick, any questions that you'd like to share with us or comments? Sure, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I graduated high school in 1988. And mm -hmm. uh, so that, that whole era is just so vivid in my imagination. Um, one thing that I, was, I wanted to ask you about was concerning the whole meta thing that Barbara was talking about. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be fun to uh, have a, a really good TV adaptation, um, staged as a doc, you know, a documentary yes. of the novel. <laughs> yes. 
That would yes, be- I would love for someone to do that. It, you know, kind of continue with my plan and uh, and pass it off as as real as possible. I think that'd be neat. Yeah, there. What was that? Uh, was it Sweet and Lowdown? Did you see that uh, documentary about the the fictional guitar player? Maybe I did song? not. Oh, it was great. Oh. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was kind of like a Django Reinhardt sort of guy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love the photographs uh, so much. And there's um, especially uh, task force members revealing the killer's mask. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the crime sketch of the... Yeah. Uh, it looks kind of yeah. like the, uh, the Beastie Boys sabotage video a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> you're right. You're right. That suit. <laughs> Oh. And this, this composite sketch. What a blast. You can't Thank wait you. to read it. It's been a fascinating discussion. Um, as far as actual questions, I think you've just, uh, they're all in awe. They're, you know, you have a lot of people saying this sounds wonderful. Uh, can't wait to read it. Uh, I've ordered the book. So no, no real questions, though. Well, then I think we should wind it up by saying thank you, Richard. It was a real treat to talk to you. I oh, got your you. note, and I thought it was very kind of you to say you had wanted to do an event with us for a long time. So I could Always. say that the same would be true for us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. So we do have copies of Chasing the Boogeyman with very nice signed book plates by Richard. So please grab one. Um, Michael Carita, otherwise known as Scott Carson. Um, we, uh, we always have Michael Greta's books at the Poison Pen, and we will have the Scott Carson book. So let me wish everybody a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. There'll be a podcast, a podcast, you ready for that? A podcast made of this, um, which will be available tonight or tomorrow, and the video will live on our Facebook page. So if you know anyone who would be interested in either watching or listening, please encourage them to do that, because no Zoom event is ever scheduled where everybody who would enjoy it is able to actually watch it live. And it's a great thing about this technology that we can preserve these conversations and keep them available. Well, as long as we have a website, right? Why yeah, not? That's right. All right, okay, good night, everybody. Thanks so much again.